after. Let's make some noise. Let's show the athletes why this is the best finish in elite level running in the UK. Yeah. For the 2021 Therma Manchester Marathon, as our first runner, Matt, comes into view. Absolutely. So we think it could be Matthew Green, this guy's fist pumping. We think it could be the St. Helens athlete. We will only see as he crosses the finish line here. The media are ready. The crowd is out in force here on Talbot Road. This is a guy making history. Two hours 18 and bits on the clock coming into the finish line wow. for the winner of the 2021 Therma Manchester Marathon. It is Matthew Green. everyone and welcome to the Bill and Running Club podcast. Today we've got a very special guest. He won the Manchester Marathon, he won the Liverpool Marathon. Ladies and gentlemen, Matthew Creel. Oh, um, cheers, man. thanks for having me on. Thank you very much for coming on today. Um, would you just like to introduce yourself a little bit? Tell people about yourself. Oh, put me on the spot there, I thought you were doing that. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so, um, well, yeah, Manchester Liverpool Marathon back in, in 2021. Mm. Um, you know, 2022 Manchester Marathon didn't go as well, uh, but the big boys yeah. came out there, so, you know. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, um, I've been running since I was about 14, 15. I uh, started at Wigan Harriers, on to St. Helens Sutton, who I still represent. I'm club chairman at. Yeah. Um, sorry, Billinge. Um, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, um, own Made to Run uh, running store in, in St. Helens. Um, plenty of Billinge runners have been in there and stuff, so yeah. um, great to see you guys in there. and You're all welcome to come in. And, yeah, as Mention we do a 10% club discount as well, so you know, please, you know, come and use that if you want. Need some new running shoes or running kit or anything like that, uh, or just some advice and stuff. But yeah. uh, you know, I know you've got plenty of guys like Dan Miller, who was an old, uh, more competitor to be fair. I never trained in his, <laughs> his in his group, but he was uh, yeah. at the track with me at Wigan Harriers, sort of thing. I mean, we ran together on uh, in a couple of races for the club, so. Right. Um, but. Uh, yeah, that'll do a thing. Yeah, I'm gonna yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> leave you, leave you with something to ask. Yeah, I, I've, you've <laughs> answered all my questions there, Matt. Thanks. Um, no, so just talking a little bit about you know winning Manchester, winning Liverpool in the same year. Um, two weeks apart. Two weeks apart. Two weeks apart. Okay, uh, amazing, dude. Um, <laughs> talk us a little bit about how that felt. You know, what was going through your mind when you come through the finish line and your first and you know, you've know you won, like what is going through your mind? How does that feel? Yeah. So two very different things, okay. uh, both Manchester and Liverpool for what was going through my mind when I crossed the yeah. finish line. Um, so for, for a start, don't doing two marathons back to back is not a new, normal thing to do. Right. Um, <laughs> I'm sure Lewis will say it's fine and I'm sure that if you want to do the live bird double uh, on New Year's Day, and uh, New Year's mm. Eve and New Year's Day, you know, there's, there's a chance to do two back to back in two days. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, like it, it's not something you would normally do. Um, the, the whole plan was was Manchester. It was always the plan. I worked with my coach, who's, who's Rory Linkletter, who's the uh, Canadian half marathon record holder. Um, oh. He's racing in Copenhagen uh, in a week's time in the half marathon, going right. again to break his own Canadian record. Wow! Um, and he ran two ten at the World Champs, finishing twentieth, um, and just ten. behind um, just behind Galen Rupp Jeez. of America, who's, who's a you know a bit of a name. Um, so yeah, he was. He's been coaching me uh, the last. Where are we? Uh, well, through Manchester 2021, yeah, and, and since then, really, uh, in the build-up to that, and, and continue. So yeah, probably May 2021, he started coaching me. Um, so the plan was always Manchester, and then we sort of hit. Um, and then, and basically, the Liverpool bit was was a little bit of a, a marketing stunt from me. Okay. Um, with the shop, um, being that obviously in Manchester around 218, um, 20. Eight, yeah, two eighteen twenty eight. Um, I beat that now, so I've forgotten about what it was. Um, <laughs> it's big headed, isn't it? Um, we'll put the time at the bottom. Yeah, I'll, I'll put that down. Um, yeah. I think it was two, two eighteen twenty eight. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so so we, we the, the goal was always always Manchester. Um, we ran that, and then Liverpool had never been under broke. No one had ever won Liverpool in under two thirty before. Okay. Um, okay obviously. Okay. There's a running shop in St. Helens, all the local club members were all going to Liverpool. Yeah. It was the last rock and roll, so it was a big you deal. You knew you had it in you. you I knew, I knew it had it in me. I'd, I'd gone, so after Manchester, I went camping for a week with my girlfriend right. um, up in the lakes. Um, surprisingly, it didn't rain, actually, uh, but it was cold because <laughs> it was October. Um, but um, um, And then, yeah, so we then sort of... Um, I felt I felt really good after after, after a week of camping. Um, I came, I did a track session, or I went down to the track on the 
Thursday before Liverpool Marathon. Right. Um, so this would be a week and a half after Manchester. Right. Um, and I thought, because in my head, my, my girlfriend was running. She was running the half that day. Um, and she was sort of saying, oh, why don't you do Liverpool? Why you? And then, um, so I thought, well, I'll go to the track and I'll just do a couple 400s. And I'll see Safe how my legs it. feel, how yeah, they feel yeah, different. Yeah. Anyway, I put, me, I put my race shoes on, hit the track. Um, I did 460 seconds, just straight off. Uh, and I thought, okay, that's all I need to do. I don't need any more. I don't need yeah, any yeah. more 400s. That's enough. If I can do 60 seconds to a week and a yeah. half after Manchester, uh, my legs are fresh enough to do another marathon. Let's go for um, it. So I went then on a Friday to the expo and I entered the marathon on right. the Friday. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, and then we, we hit Liverpool. So I'd spoke to... So I'd, I'd got the idea in my head leading up to it. My girlfriend had been saying about it. And I thought, well, you know, it was a good marketing sort of, you know, play. You, you, you'd, if I could win it, and running like a mate to run best stuff like that, you'd pay probably 10 grand for the level of marketing I was going to get off the back of it, you know, Definitely. for like the coverage you were going to get in the race, the photos, yeah. the newspaper coverage, all the rest mm. of it. Um, so it's like, you know what, like, it's a bit of a stunt, it's a bit of a thing, but you know, I'll still try and run. So I convinced my mum from yeah. the business perspective, because she she's in the shop with me. Um, I'm sure we'll, there'll be a question about her later on. Yeah. Um, so I, I won't spoil that yet. Um, and then, um, so, yeah, so so I convinced her, and then I had to convo convince Rory. Yeah. Um, so I, I was messaging Rory, I said, "Rory, I'm thinking of doing another marathon," and he was like, "What are you on about? Like you're mad!" Like, um, and I was yeah. like, "Well, yeah." I said, "But like, look, I've got a business, and it's the." And he, said, he said, "He said, okay." He said, "As long as you promise me, you're gonna run it easy." I said, "Well, if no okay. one's broke 2:30." He said, well, "Okay, just run 2:30 pace then." Okay, yeah. okay, yeah, I'm gonna do 2:30 pace. I, I won't go any faster than that. I just, I just run it. Um, so I started with a 440 mile, um, <laughs> which is as fast as I started wow. in Manchester. So okay. you're talking 206 pace, something like that, uh, Jesus, you know, to yeah. set off. But that's stay full of, of my racing and my running. Um, though hopefully in London in a couple of weeks, I'm, I'm going to have matured and, and grown up a little bit and, and maybe we'll be more reserved. I'm going to ask you about later. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Don't want to give any tactics away, but yeah. I, I'm going to pick your mind on a few of these. Yeah. Um, but getting back to, I suppose, the question, what was going through my head. So, yeah, in, in Manchester, when I came to finish, so I, I went off I went off hard in Manchester. Um, and I, I don't blame myself. I blame um, uh, one of the other lads, actually, who, who uh, runs for Salford. And his name has completely escaped me right now. Um, he finished third in the race in the end. Um, but he's, I've completely blanked on him, to be fair. I know him and I've raced against him and I'm, I'm blanking. But um, he, he he's it was his first marathon. Um, it was my second, Manchester was. Um, and he... He went off quick. It starts downhill, Manchester, so you do right. pick up a bit of speed. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, we, we got to the first mile, and I just turned to him and said, "Look, I said, I said we're only doing the, we're doing the full here, you know." And we we we'd hit 440 for the first mile, wow. um, and he was like, oh, "You know," yeah. and uh, I don't know whether I can swear on this. Can I swear on this? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. He, so he, he was like, "Oh shit," you know, and uh, he backed off then, and um, and so so. But I thought, you know what? Like, I feel really good. I just gotta keep going. Um, so we kept going. Then another lad caught up with me and ran with him. We went through the the, the city bit of it, and we cheered. I cheered on the, the guys on the opposite side of me when we were running down. And then he, um, I said to him, we got to 10k. I said, I said oh, you know, what time are you looking at running? He said, oh, you know, trying to break, trying to run 2:14 or so, which in my head was what I sort of went. I said, oh, great. I said, well, we're running about 2:10, 2:10, 2:09 mm. pace at the moment. So I said, mm. I said. Unless, you know, we're going to smash it unless we die here. Yeah. Um, at which point he dropped back off the pace then. Uh, and I ended up on my own from 10k. Right. Um, and I just kept going. Um, so we hit, I hit halfway. I'd slowed a bit, but I was at about 212 pace to okay. two, yeah, yeah. 12 and a half. Um, so still on for that 214. But I started to panic because I'd never been the in a marathon before in that position in that position so never been ahead. winning it i've never been that that sort of pace I'd, you know i've done one marathon before and i'd blown up in it yeah. um, and so i was scared of blowing up because i'd blown up just after halfway in my first marathon yeah. um, and it was a fueling thing and i'm sure we'll, we'll jump on fueling later but yeah. um I, I yeah so I, I i started to panic a little bit i thought i'm leading this race i'm sure i'm being because it was broadcast live and stuff like that. I'm sure I'm being like ripped into by some of the lads I know and stuff especially some of the Manchester the lads and stuff like that mm. um, I thought what, what do I do here do I keep pushing do I back off I said in my head I was like well you know what I just want to win it now like I'm yeah. leading I don't know where anyone is behind me I don't know how far just the gap going. is anything keep I just going. want to win so I, I just backed off yeah, and yeah, yeah. you know I, back, I kept backing off thinking someone's going to come someone's going to come just just back off enough that when it comes to the last 5k you've got something you can dig yeah. in and then we got to the last 5k there's still no one around me um, I think a cyclist came from behind and, and I shouted I said Where, where's the next guy and he said oh your mouth's clear Honestly. so then I was like oh okay well, well let's not let's not go yet let's just okay. keep waiting and so I was so you know I, was, I wanted to go with 5k to go and then I said well two miles to go we'll go 
one mile to go, we'll go. And then it was basically, I turned the corner and the straight was there. Okay, well, let's go. And so we just started sprinting down the home straight then. And then like the, the crowd was, was fantastic. It was buzzing, um, you know, because we're 2021. So we, we're October 2021. So this, we're still just getting back to mass participation events, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, the Great North Run was probably the first one, which I'd done the month prior, and which was a fantastic atmosphere, but was an awful race for me because the course was, was dreadful. Yeah. Um, the course, luckily for everyone running tomorrow, um, is, is, is back to the usual course and, and, and should be a lot nicer for them, but uh, I don't think you could pay me to go and do it after doing it last year. Oh, it, was, right. it, was, it was a nightmare. Um, but that was the, the change in course for COVID yeah. and stuff. Um, but, uh, so yeah, the, the atmosphere was fantastic. And yeah, it was just, you know, I, I sort of, you know, waving to the crowds coming down the last straight and all the, yeah. all the fanfare and stuff. And that's they, gonna they, be, that's gonna be the intro, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you've already seen that. <laughs> yeah, um, seen so that. Um, um, and yeah, like you know, cheers to the crowds, both hands up. You know, the number one sort of thing, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, before I crossed the line, I, I, I style my hair just to make sure it's in place. Um, I was before I crossed, you know, because I knew the photos were coming. <laughs> uh, I haven't got an ego or anything. Um, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, it was, it was fantastic. Uh, it was my 30th birthday actually that day as well, so it was, it was a great was it? birthday present. Fantastic. So I came home then and we went to um, Turk's Head in St. Helens, yeah, uh, which is my sort of pub. regular pub sort of thing. So uh, we went in there and we booked the top out and we just had a big 30th birthday party, so fantastic, it was cracking. I don't remember much after sort of 9pm to be fair. Um, a huge celebration. Um, and then yeah, Liverpool, um, the, the, um, it was a... It was a very challenging thing. So I'd, mm. I'd gone into Manchester very much focused on the race, nutrition really well leading up to the, the, the race day, um, hydrating and everything like that. Mm. Um, Liverpool, obviously, I'd only decided on the Friday with the race being the Sunday that I was going to run it. Yeah. So I hadn't done any of that leading up to the day. Um, it, was my, it was my girlfriend's main race. It was what she'd been training for. So the night before I said, well, you know, yeah. what do you want sort of thing not what i want because yeah. what i want is a very odd main last race meal uh, i'm sure we'll get on to that well uh, um, yes <laughs> but um, I'm, 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 I'm jumping all your questions here but um so you know so i wasn't i wasn't as fueled and stuff going into it and then it was also it was it was paper cups or plastic cups yeah. rather than bottles um on the race on, on, on the race course so I, I didn't get any hydration on it and from about 16 miles in i was cramping like mad mm. um luckily the guy on the lead bike sort of knew me and um there's ian roberts actually um from um prime try coaching and stuff like that a little shout out there to those guys um and he he was sort of trying, you know, encouraged me a little bit on and stuff. And he was saying, you know, you know, there's no one behind, or you know, if you need you're cramping, they say, you know, stop and stretch out and stuff yeah. like that. Um, and I was like, no, no, I'm not going to stop because if I stop, I'm not going to get going again. And anyway, 23 miles in, I had to stop and stretch. Like I, 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 I luckily at the Penny Lane point, you do a U-turn and come back. And so I timed myself from Penny Lane yeah. to when I saw the next guy and then doubled the, the time. So I knew how I had five minutes on him at yeah, that yeah. point. Um, sadly, he was a guy from um, from down south that had come up to do the race, knowing that no one had broke 2.30 on it and knowing that right. he could break 2.30 on it. Um, so he'd come especially to do that. And then I rocked up and ruined the fun for him ruined his day. Um, oh, a little no. bit. But um, And he did break 2.30 as well. So we both managed to, to go sub 2.30 wow. on it. So it was the first two ever on, on the Liverpool course, or at least the modern Liverpool course. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, 23 miles in, I, I had to stop and just stretch my hamstring stretch out because it, it was so bad because it hits the cobbles on the, on the front. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a bit of a nightmare. Um, and so what was going through my head as I crossed the line there, and you can see it on, on any of the photos if you track them down, is basically the F word. Um, right. And I'm literally <laughs> saying it out loud, not just doing it in my head uh, as I crossed the line because it was cramping like mad yeah. as I finished. Well, you um, won it, man. <laughs> um, another thing, Mo Farah. You've run against Mo Farah. Yeah. At the Antrim Coast half, yeah. is that correct? Yeah, yeah. How did that feel? When yeah, you're on so the start line and, you know, he's, he's there next yeah. to you, like, it's, what's going through your mind then? It's, so it's a funny one, this one, because, like, people have asked me this before, and, mm. like, I mean, you know, Mo is, is considerably better than, than me in performance um, from, <laughs> you know, Olympic medals and world champs, the times. Um, but it, when you're on the start line with... With, with anyone, they're a competitor, and you can't, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, you can't think of them as anything other than a competitor. They can't be, yeah. you know, the, cha the Olympic champion. They can't be, you know, they've just got to be another guy that you're lining up against that you're ready to kill out on the course and race, you know, because you've got to beat them. And, you know, obviously yeah. the chance of beating Mo is, is, yeah, I think he finished five minutes, I think five, 30, five minutes 30 ahead of me there, sort of thing, probably I'm a whole mile ahead of me, uh, easily a whole mile ahead of me um, at the half there. Um, but that's how I view Mo. And the, the, uh, there was a, I had a great photo 
um, that it was taken on, on that course because it was it was a um, it was right in the middle of 2020 it was September yeah. 2020 when I went and did it and so it was completely COVID sort of regulations uh, it was an elite only race there was only 20 yeah. there was 25 of us in wave one 25 of us in wave two and then the, and then the ladies race as well of, uh, I think they were only a 20 or so um, and so there's, I was with Mo uh, in, in Mo's wave. I think I just made the cut. Um, yeah, I think I was like 21st fastest in there. Right. I finished 13th, so I was really happy about that because you know, you beat a couple of guys who should really, on paper, should have beaten me. Wow. Um, and yeah, I mean, Mo won that day in, in something like 60, oh, 60 uh, no, I think around about 60 dead, to be fair, just right. after 60 dead, because I think Mark Scott ran 60 30 or something like that, and then Ben Connor was third in 61. Um, and I mean, those, all those guys were fantastic. Mark Scott had just broke Mo Farah's 5K road record about a month earlier. Um, you know, obviously Mo, was, Mo had just broke the world record a week earlier on the hour on the track sort of thing. So they were all revving up. They were all in great yeah, shape. Yeah. Uh, and they were, you know, they were all doing, or Mark, uh, no, they were, neither of them were doing it actually, but the London Marathon was being put on in the elite race and there was the million laps of that park near the, near the uh, palace and things, yeah. wasn't it? So, um, but uh, yeah, there's, there's a photo of me Mo and Mark Scott all walking to the the start line together, um, and, yes, I, and I I'm, like, I'm like I'm like I'm like eyeing Mo up like proper like you know yeah. like I, I'm I'm coming for you sort of thing <laughs> um, on this photo. I mean, like I say, I'm I was sure well I've over seen, a mile behind, but I'm sure um, I've seen that photo, and uh, I'll add that I'll put that photo on screen now. Yeah. I do remember <laughs> that. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so London, London Marathon in three weeks. Mm -hmm. um, how has this training block gone for you? Are you on a taper at the moment? Uh, not like not yet. Uh, so this has been my most consistent training marathon mm. training block so far. Yeah. Um, I mean, Manchester was pretty good last year uh, in, in October. That, that block was it was relatively solid. There were some ups and downs. <coughs> uh, Manchester this year was was pretty horrific. To be fair, um, to have come away with a, a 10 second PB there was was, was really good. Um, mm. Off the off the way the, the build went because I was meant to be doing Seville in February right. uh, that was originally the plan so I started training um, November I, I, came, I, I got invited out to the Caribbean to race a half marathon in the Caribbean um, which then got cancelled oh what a bad life um, <laughs> free, free pay trip to the beaches of the Caribbean um, and then um, see this is what you can do with running yeah, keep it going guys and um, but um, yeah so I came back I was meant to jump into marathon training and yep. just sort of Put a bit of weight on because yeah the race got cancelled in the Caribbean so I, I just enjoyed basically yourself. I enjoyed myself I, yeah, I yeah. sat on the beach with my girlfriend because I got I got her the free as well with the race yeah. sort of thing um, and then is it all inclusive all inclusive all pay yeah. for, all we had to do was pay, pay to get to Paris and then right. the, we went from Paris to uh, Martinique um, which is a, a French uh, colonial island sort of thing so it was all paid for from there and then um, yeah we, we just chilled. basically there was there was when we got there it was funny actually we got there and there was protests and we didn't yeah. know about it we were we were down on the beach chilling. Yeah. Like this was like three days to the race, so we were just chilling on the beach. Got back to the the hotel we, uh, they were staying in, and the rest of the elite athletes came around. And said, oh, have you heard that the race is cancelled? Like, all right, oh. no, no. Like, why? Oh, there's been riots. Police have been shot dead and things. Oh, and I'm like, oh my god, I said, we've just been lying on the beach. <laughs> so I was like, I was like, oh, what's going on then? They said, oh, well, they're going to sort some stuff out. So they all went round on their own, but like, because I was with my girlfriend, like, we were just like, oh, well, yeah, I just want to go. Just chill, well, don't we? So, it, so we just we, we were just on the beach in the roof bars and stuff like that, and we were just just enjoying it. So, did, you know, that was a it was like five days of just just Honestly. luxury, enjoy drinking and, and eating. Um, so then I came back a little bit overweight uh, for, for as a runner, uh, you know, race weight sort of weight uh, over that, and then um, so tried to jump into my marathon training, but carrying a little bit more weight, put a little bit too much pressure through my knee. I sort of threw my knee out a little bit, and okay. so. I just had this this nagging injury then that consist can, you know was just the all the way through December. I think Christmas Day Christmas Day I went out in the morning to do a run. I was going to go into Witness Park Run, um, a progressive run all the way, and then finish with the park run. I got two miles down the road and it was just agony, and I just thought there's just no point in this. Was that like uh, IT band or just a bit of runner's knee? Or? Yeah, sort of runner's knee. I just put too much force through the knee by carrying a little bit more weight and stuff yeah, like that, and it just just irritated it, just the tendons, ligaments yeah. around. Um, and so, yeah, so I sort of then ended up settling, you know, I took a week off there for Christmas because we were going down to London for, for New Year's. So I just yeah. ended up rolling it into a, a week off, which again, I ate too much and drank too much for. Um, <laughs> so that was like hit and miss sort of, sort of thing. Yeah. Then I got tried to get back running again, was, was getting there and then me, me was still bothering me and booked, booked to go out to Seville. So we went there, but my coach said, let's just do it as a, because uh, I ran for England. Um, yeah just before that um, I got selected so uh, 
I sort of made it through the race, but it was a, it was a it was a half marathon and it was six miles six and a bit miles uphill and six and a bit miles downhill, which on a knee injury is not the sort of course you want. No. Um, so it, you know it was, it was my slowest half marathon in about four or five years, mm. um, sixty eight something, um, and so I was it, you know it was great to represent England. It was great to, to get that vest and that call up sort yeah. of thing. Um, but uh, it was a disappointing race overall from a performance perspective. Um, and it, it messed me up a little bit. So the yeah. week after that wasn't much. Then, yeah, I think I had two weeks then to Seville. So then it was out to Seville. My coach had said, well, let's just do 15 miles at marathon pace and we'll use it as a session rather than the race. Um, I managed, I think I was averaging five mile pace. Um, I got through eight miles and it just was hurting too much. So um, I ran past my girlfriend who was sat in a cafe having a... Uh, a coffee and stuff or hot chocolate I think um, and I thought you know what like by the time I go to 15 I'm gonna be all the way on the other side of the city I'm just gonna pull hair yeah. and pull the plug and I just go and watch the rest of the race so we did that and then I went staying at my cousin's house in Marbella so um, again drank too much yeah. and ate too much for a week. Well um, that's fantastic but <laughs> speaking about food and all inclusive yeah. and stuff like that um, <laughs> you did tell me something once in your shop which I'm gonna come to in a minute but um, <coughs> <coughs> Pre-race food, mm -hmm. uh, carbo loading, hydration. Yep. Um, loads of people are interested in this kind yep. of stuff. Um, would you like to tell people about your your pre-race ritual yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and why <laughs> you do it? And yeah. I, I remember when you told me it made a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think it makes sense, but you know, people challenge me on it. Um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so I mean, so so the, the the week leading up to the race is 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 where I think is important. I think the night mm. before the race isn't as important apart from make sure you're not going to have something that's going to upset your stomach. Yeah. So, a uh, week leading up to the race, I'll pretty much, from if the race is Sunday, from Tuesday on, I'll have pasta every night for my tea. Mm -hmm. Different types of pasta, you know, don't want to get bored and stuff, but yeah. pasta every night, uh, you know, breakfast and stuff, keep it simple, you know, porridge or toast or whatever, yeah, and something, yeah. a sandwich for lunch or whatever. Uh, but yeah, for tea, I always have, um, um, always have some pasta. Um, and then, yeah, the night before the race, so basically the, the, the day of the race, uh, sorry, the, the day before the race, again, breakfast, nice simple porridge, toast, whatever. Um, for lunch, I'll have pasta again. And then for my evening meal, this is what um, we were so this, this, is, this is the one, this is the one. Is um, I'll have a McDonald's um, and, and a beer, and a beer. Um, usually a Budweiser, because you, know, you want a light beer, don't, don't go for a, a, you know, if you like real ale, I like real ale, but it's yeah. just a little bit too heavy. No Guinness. Uh, no before. Guinness or anything like that, yeah, you, you just want a light beer, really. Um, but, um, and, and so, yeah, so the reasoning behind this, and this is my justification, and the, the guys at the England camp and uh, team, they all laughed at me, and uh, they still question me before a race, is what, is, <laughs> do I have that? And to be fair, every time I've avoid, uh, I've not had that, I've not mm. run as well, so, you know, Honestly. there's my point for that. Yeah, Antrim a couple of weeks ago, didn't have yeah. it. And uh, yeah, didn't, didn't feel as good uh, come race day. Uh, so, but yeah, there, so the reason behind it is, uh, one is, don't is have, make sure you have something that isn't going to upset your stomach. Well, used McDonald's to is used to, you, it, you're used to it, yeah. Um, but you know, wherever you go in the world to race, you can pretty much guarantee there's a McDonald's. You can't guarantee there's going to be your favourite pasta. You can't guarantee there's going to be your favourite restaurant or whatever like that things. So McDonald's, you, you can guarantee, and it's going to be pretty much the same. The fries are the same. The chicken nuggets are the same. The Big Mac's the same. Um, Smart, and it's yeah. high in salt, so you're going to lose a lot of salt come marathon day. Um, you know, you can get electrolyte drinks and all that, but you're going to have to carry them. You could get you know, salt sticks, all the rest of it. But just preload it with the McDonald's the night before, and you're sorted. Um, and then, and then, and the beer. Um, so it's you know, it's, it's carbs. It's you know, there's no nutritional real value there or anything like that. But you know, it's 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 carbs. It's plenty of salt there, mm. um, and it's it's something that you know is really basic, really easy to get access to wherever you are. Yeah. Um, it's also really just like <clears throat> like normal. I mean, yeah. I suppose it's not normal if you don't have McDonald's that much, but it's a fairly normal sort of casual thing to have. Like I think sometimes. Um, you know, if, you, if you've got a, if you're having a pasta dish and you're like, well, I've got to have this much pasta and do this and everything, that, like, you're starting already, like, the race is the next day and you're already starting to overthink, like, what you're doing and panicking about stuff and stressing about uh, how much, especially, like, you know, if you go abroad and, you know, oh, I've got to have this dish and you can't mm -hmm. have it and you start to stress. So, yeah. you know, it, it just keeps it really casual and that's what the beer is as well. It's like, you know, you'd have a beer, you know, on a Saturday night with your mates or whatever yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. Day with your girlfriend at home and, you know, put a film on or whatever. So, why not just do that the night yeah. before a race? I mean, don't go drinking, like, you know, six bottles. Yeah, but it, it gives you something less to think about. Yeah, you know just, there's Budweiser all over the... Uh, and there's McDonald's. Yeah. 
you know, it's just, a, it's, it's, just a nice, it's just a nice casual sort of thing. Stops you overthinking about the race. You're just, you're just taking it as like a normal evening. There's yeah. nothing major coming the next day, which there you're is, not but you're not it. overthinking it. Yeah. Uh, and so that's my reasoning behind it. So Perfect. yeah, thumbs up or thumbs down, um, uh, whether you think that's a good <laughs> enough reasoning behind that. Well, or not. it makes sense to me. <laughs> uh, but moving forward, um, distances. So right now we know you're, um, you're kind of training for the marathon and stuff, yeah. but you're also, Pretty uh, shit out at the 5Ks and stuff like that. Um, what about the track stuff? I've yeah. looked on Run Britain. I think you've done one 800 event. Was it the Northern League this year? Yeah, yeah. Would you... I wasn't particularly happy with that. <laughs> would you, after, you know, after marathons and stuff, <laughs> would you go back to track stuff or do you feel like you're going to stay with the marathon? There's, there's a bit of me that, that likes the idea of when I turn 40, trying to, uh, which is 10 years away, uh, oh, nearly nine years away, um, is is trying to have a go at going back and, and doing like the mile okay. and trying to do a sub four mile at 40 sort of thing. People oh. have done it before and, um, you know, I mean, for, I'm, I'm built more like a, a 1500 meter, 800 meter guy than I am a marathon guy. Yeah. Um, you probably, I don't know if you can see my legs on there, but uh, I won't try <laughs> and stretch them up because I'll probably pull something, but um, but they're, 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 they're more powerful build than, than the typical marathon uh, distance legs that you, you might see on a start line or something. Um, but um, yeah, and I started out as an 800 meter runner, 1500 meter runner. Uh, like I say I ran with Dan Miller, uh, yeah. but we both did those distances early on. Actually, Dan's probably a little stockier build as well. Actually. He is actually. Uh, maybe it's a Wigan thing. For, for, and, um, um, for an ultra run, he's got yeah, big yeah, legs yeah, as well, yeah, yeah. like yourself. Um, so yeah, so I, I wouldn't mind going back to that. Um, I'd have to do a lot more conditioning work than I've ever done before, I think, because mm. I think I would definitely break down injured. And I think that was yeah. the reason why I moved over to the marathon in the end and, and the longer sort of stuff. Because when I first came back running, so um, so I took a break uh, from running when I went to uni for about five years. So I started back running, what, about 2016. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I didn't really run at all. I'd done, you know, the odd park run, something like that. that maybe the club, I'd come back over the summer and the club had got me to jump yeah. in a Northern League for them or something like that and just try and get round and get some points. Um, but uh, yeah, I sort of was, yeah, I love, I love the track stuff, but yeah, I, I realized that I just didn't have, well, I had the speed, but I would get, I'd break down really easy. My Achilles would go, stuff like that. I'd, I'd need to do a lot of strength and conditioning work and I just wasn't that interested in doing strength and conditioning and I'm still not that interested in doing strength and conditioning work. Pretty typical yeah. distance runner there. Um, when you I, say that, do you, are you talking like in the gym weights kind of stuff um, or not necessarily just like just conditioning just stretching just you know right. hip mobility uh, you know just yeah. i mean I, so if i get injured i absolutely hammer conditioning get rid of the injury and then forget what i was doing uh <laughs> until i get injured again um and that's pretty typical of most distance runners and I, most I runners to be so, fair yeah. uh, you know I think I, I have this conversation with customers in the shop and we all pretty much agree we're all the same. Um, I think good if you, if you come from like a gym background and that's where you started and then you got into running, you, you're quite good at keeping that routine in there. Yeah. And there's, there's an advantage to doing that. Um, but they always say, as you get older, you lose power. So you need to do strength work. You, if you want to maintain the speed, you need to do that strength work and stuff like that. So, yeah. you know, and you know, people obviously, not everyone does, but you know some of these guys that are in the forties, fifties, and stuff like. That, I mean, um, Graham Green is, is a great example. Uh, Warrington Way uh, sort of guy, and he, you know, I know, I know he's been injured and stuff like that, but he, he, you know, he's a he's a big, powerful fella. Like, um, but he, he's also like I think over fifty, and and you know he's run sort of two thirty or something like that for the marathon sort of thing at that age. I mean, he ran quicker than that in his prime, but he, you know he's maintained that. Yeah. Um, there's there's the vet 60 guy, the Irish fella that, again, his name is completely escaped me, but he did, he did Antrim the year I did it. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, I, I think he Hughes, is it Tommy Hughes, something like that? That rings a bell, might be Tommy Hughes. He's, he's vet 60, again, sub 230 marathon runner, Fantastic. but he's, he's a, you know, he's not a, he's not a, he's not a stick yeah. thin, you know, yeah, yeah. stereotypical distance he's running build, marathon build. He's, he's a, he's a, and you know, cause he spends a lot of time doing, and he said it, you know, doing gym stuff and, and weights and things that to maintain yeah. that, that strength and that speed. Um, so yeah, for, for me, I mean, I love doing speed work. Most of my marathon sort of plans and training all consists of, you know, a lot of track work, you know, at least really? on the track once a week or so, um, okay. you know, I'll do, you know, 400s, you know, I mean, yeah, 20, 30 times 400 meters, um, stuff like that. I did 20, it was meant to be 20 times 400 meters this marathon block, but I like doing 
big stuff. And so I, I went up to 30 and my coach told me off for that because uh, he, he had put 20 and I, dis, I dis, uh, disobeyed him there. And, uh, I, I find that interesting <laughs> that you say that because obviously I'm not that well educated on the marathon side. Because um, obviously, you know, for, you know, if, if you're trying to duck under 14 or duck under 15 for the 5K, yeah. that is, it's a lot of speed work yeah. involved there as well. I, I'm surprised to hear there's speed work in marathon training. Um, so, so what would be the main difference if you wanted to, if you wanted to stop the marathon now and be yeah. like, right, I'm doing the 5K or the 10, <clears throat> what would you tweak in your training? Um, so I, th I, I wouldn't, not a huge amount to be fair. Okay. Um, there would be the mileage, because I, I, I typically run between 80 to 100 mile weeks mm. um, is in my marathon block. That's, that's yeah. typically what I found works for me. Um, and I probably would run that sort of mileage. Mm. Um, there would might be, they, they, I'd probably change sort of like, so some of my long runs become sessions. So uh, like today I did 15, I so I did three mile warm up, 15 mile at marathon pace um, and cool down and then three mile cool, two mile cool down. Um, so 20 miles total. Um, other days, you know, other big lot sessions I've done where I've done like um, two mile warm up, 10 miles at 6.10, 10 miles at 5.10, yeah. two mile cool down. I probably would get rid of them. My long runs would just be easy paced long runs. Right. So I might still run 15 to 20 miles, but yeah. I'd just run at everything probably more like seven minute mile pace to eight minute yeah. mile pace, just nice comfy. It'd be a recovery run. It wouldn't yeah. be a session, um, which would then allow me to bring in a slightly more speed orientated Right. session in there so i'd still have the, the the bulky sort of track session that i do so 2400s or something like that um i'd be targeting more to run them at close uh, faster than 5k pace and things so that yeah. would stimulate running that sort of you know, sort of thing um and then i'd probably do a shorter track session as well in there um so you know maybe some 200s and, and things or yeah, some yeah. 300s or something like that not as many bigger recoveries really top end sort of building speed and stuff like that mm. um and and as i come towards the main rate especially for the 5k the 10k maybe not i'd still keep a bulk bit in there um mm. but as i come towards sort of the you know 5k race season and stuff like that um yeah i'd probably maybe you know decrease the miles a little bit come down to that 80 you know, maybe drop to 70, 60, yeah. just to really let my body feel fresh and really make sure I can really hit that pure quality on the speed session days and, and stuff. Then just like increase the speed session. Yeah, yeah. Well, right. not increase the distance, but increase the the, the speed. The speed. So because okay. my body's oh, a little okay. bit fresher, there's a little bit more there. Um, but you know, in, in the winter, I'd have I, you know, I'd keep that miles high, those 80 to 100s. Yeah. But then as I come round to like you know your main road season, or if I was doing track 5Ks, yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, I probably would just bring it down to the 60, just so that that. So the way I'd work is probably, you know, my club changed Tuesday, Thursday. So mm. longer sort of track session on a Tuesday, shorter track session on a Thursday. Right. So four, say 2400s yeah. on, a, on a Tuesday and then five by 300 or something like that on a Thursday. But right. with like three minutes rest between each 300. Yeah. But that three, those 300s are all out. Like they are everything I can give sort of thing. You know, yeah. they are right on the edge. Um, sort of stuff. Um, and that's probably, you know, I'd probably sort of do something like that. Right. Um, so real intense intense stuff there um which is which you know i don't do in the marathon training my don't, i yeah. still do you know i still do some 300 efforts but we're probably doing like 20 or 30 300 efforts you, you, sort you, of thing so a, you're doing them at like 70 percent not 100 percent effort just like um, you're not yeah really you, well you're doing you're doing, you're doing them a... just below marathon pace so you, you, yeah. you, you you're 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 getting yourself used to running quicker than you would race a marathon but obviously you're doing shorter distances and you've got recovery yeah, between yeah. them but your recoveries are kept short as well on on that because you're doing right. more of them um but then, yeah, if you're doing the five k, you, you, you know, you, there's, you need more speed in that sort of yeah. thing. So yeah, you need um, that, that kick, don't you? Yeah. Um, as well, speaking about training and stuff, um, I saw this on your Instagram once. Uh, I don't know if you do this anymore. Um, altitude tent. Yeah. So is that um, something you you keep in your rotation of um, training, or is that like? Do you not do that anymore? I I, I've not done that for a bit now, yeah. Uh, I'm not 100 sure how my girlfriend would feel about it, actually. Um, that was something I did when I, when I was more on my own. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, like, it, it's... I, I felt like it had a benefit. Um, I've run quicker times now, having not used it. But yeah. I've also trained a lot more now than when I was using it. So, you know. Um, it, was, it was interesting. Yeah. Um, it was expensive. 
Um, is it just lack of oxygen in the tent? Is so, so it's, it? it's basically, um, so you, you get a tent, <clears throat> beds in the tent or whatever like that. You can get them to train on apparatus as well, but most people say you, you sleep altitude and you train low, so yeah. live, live high, train low. So Kenyans, stuff like that, we'll, we'll, we'll obviously live uh, in like Eldoret and things like that, and then they'll come down slightly lower to do the yeah. track training and stuff like that, the oh, intensity right. work. Um, um, and then yeah, if you if you look at like the guys that like <coughs> who go out to like Saint Moritz or anything like that, if you watch any of those videos and oh. stuff or uh, Fort Muir and things, so you're at higher altitude and then they'll come down to like the lake and stuff or yeah. the track and it'll be slightly more closer to sea level, so you can train a little bit more intense. Um, but I, the, the idea of the tent is yeah, you have got this tent and then you've got a you've basically got a, a generator um, and it's so noisy the generator. <laughs> this is why this is why girlfriends probably would say no to it. Um, <laughs> I've never asked it to be fair, um, but uh, it, it's a really noisy generator. Generator and it, it, I used to have it in, in my house, I used to have it in the conservatory yeah, and yeah. I used to have a hose pipe then feeding from that out through the roof of my conservatory up into my bedroom window <laughs> and then into the tent and basically what the, what the generator is doing is it's changing the amount of oxygen in the air to create, simulate the level, that, the oxygen that would be in the to air at, at yeah. altitude. Right. So you can set it at different points. So you can you can use them for, um, if you're gonna go up Everest and things like that, they, they use it for base camp training and stuff right. to, to simulate. So you can go up to 18,000 feet, um, simulate oxygen sort of Jeez. thing. And that's, that's if you're doing that. If you, you know, yeah. altitude training, um, for as a runner, you, you probably only want to go, you, you know, maybe 10,000 feet max sort of thing. Uh, and even that, that's, you know, that's a high level. Font Remure is 3,000 feet, um, which is where a lot of people go. And St. Moritz is a little higher. Flagstaff, Arizona, uh, uh, a so slightly higher do you point. So do you have to spend long periods in this or can you just go sit in it for an hour yeah you, I, you, what, well, I, 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 I would sleep in it so um it tends okay. to you need you need eight to ten hours in there right. uh, for to, it, get to, the to get the benefit of it um and and uh, there's there's arguments of whether it actually works or not um because if you went if you went to altitude you'd probably spend even more time there and stuff like that really yeah. um there's a placebo effect as there is in many things um you know, you, you pay the amount of money you pay for one of them sort of thing. You've you, you got to believe in your head well, that it's going I've to do seen, something. I've seen the cost uh, of them. I was like, okay. Yeah, yeah. I looked into it, I was like, okay, forget that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I've got a second hand one. Um, but, um, um, but, yeah, so, I mean, it felt like it, it had an effect. Like, yeah. the first the first 10 days or so in it, like, it was, I struggled to sleep. I'd wake up with a, a massive, like, headache. Like, I was hungover sort of thing as, you, as your body's adjusting. Because, basically... You, it's, it's the same as, as you go out to train. It's the same. It's the same effect as blood doping does. Yeah. Um, so basically, you're, you're producing more red blood cells. So obviously, right. when you when you blood dope, you take blood cells out, freeze them, and then put them back into the body. Once your body's created, yeah, like yeah, you yeah. know, rege regenerate the blood cells that you've lost. You then add them back in. Mm. Um, whereas when you're actually training, what you're doing is is your body. You're at a point where there's less oxygen, so your body has to create more red blood cells to absorb what little oxygen there is. Yeah. So that's what the that's what the so you, you're creating more red blood cells in the body blood doping obviously does that without having to go anywhere and do that and obviously why is it illegal because it's dangerous because yeah. by freezing it it thickens the blood so you're more at risk of injuries yeah, and dying and all stuff like that um, and there's various drugs that they then have to put in there to try and yeah and stuff and hence loads of deaths and you know cycling and all the rest well, of it and, and running i um, did see um something interesting um have you heard of the wim hof method you know the mm. guy the the, the, the cold, cold guy yeah, yeah, yeah. he's got this like breath technique yeah, and he yeah. does sell on the fact uh, that will do a similar thing have you ever tried yeah. anything like that or? no i mean i've tried so i tried like the altitude mask training things so if you see in there oh, I've seen so them. i mean they're, they're they're i thought they was a fast me yeah they are a fast yeah uh, i mean they're, they're good like so i sort of, I, I have asthma i suffer from asthma uh, as all distance runners do uh, <laughs> I've, I've had it since I was a kid, so, you know, it's, it's a legitimate asthma. It's not a, uh, you know, let's all have inhalers sort of asthma. Yeah. Um, but, um, yeah, it's sort of, what it does is it, it, it ends up, it's basically a resistance trainer for your lungs. So it, it, it limits the amount of oxygen, it limits the amount of uh, you can get in, not oxygen. To strengthen so it doesn't, them. So yeah, so, yeah. That so, makes sense, so yeah. whereas the altitude tent actually changed the amount of oxygen in the air, mm. that doesn't, it just limits the amount of breath you can take in because it's, it's so you know it's, you it's could, like a Darth Vader mass basically. You can potentially um, get stronger lungs, but you're not going to get like the r red blood cells. Yeah, you're not going to do any. Of the, yeah. yeah, you're just going to strengthen your, your, your lungs um, and your heart to an extent because you're increasing the the, the um, respiratory and the cardiovascular sort of system and things yeah, like yeah. that. Um, so it's great from that perspective. And I must have looked mad when I used to go down the track and train <laughs> with it, my my old group at sort of stuff like wearing this mask as we're running around efforts and stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you are you breathing like Darth Vader like sort of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
So there you go. Um, <laughs> your family history of athletics. Yep. Uh, it's fantastic. Um, would you like to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah. So obviously, I mentioned my mum earlier. She's mm. she's she's the real star. Um, right. She's uh, Olympics 1988 in the marathon. So yeah, this this is where it all comes from. Um, genetic freak. Um, but um, uh, that's me, not her. Well, she probably is as well. <laughs> I actually think about it. Um, but yeah, she was. Um, yeah, 1988 Olympics uh, in the marathon. She was, she was a 10,000 meter runner primarily, mm. um, hence the reason I didn't pay any attention to it when she told me how I should train for the marathon and things like that. Right, okay. Um, and she kept, because I asked her for advice and she would turn around and say, yeah. well, you know, this is what I did, or this is what you should do, and things like that. I said, but I wasn't a marathon runner, so what do I know? So I said, all right, okay, I won't listen to you. Um, <laughs> hence, made loads of mistakes. Um, but um, no, she was a 10,000 meter runner. She, yeah. she ran um, 32.27. Um, there you go, fellas. Try and chase that one down. Uh, my mate John Joe still hasn't beaten it, I don't think. Um, I still tease him for it. Um, it was an English record at the time. Um, and that qualified her for the, the first ever women's 10,000 meter um, world champion, uh, 10,000 meters in the world championships in Rome in 87. Um, so yeah. um, basically, she, she, she ran in the trials, uh, the UK champs, the trials, and she won it. Uh, but they didn't want to send her because she was a northern runner um, and they wanted to send the three girls from down south who were the in crowd and, and, and wanted to go. Um, so they said, oh, well, we'll send you all to the Bislett Games in Oslo. Mm. And the first three there, we'll, we'll take them. Yeah. Um, so she went to Oslo, which to be fair is her proudest memory favorite memory of running um because oslo is um it's at the side of um it's like it's the business games it's got a, a like, like well it used to have like a, a sort of like cliff face behind the track so that the stadium comes right up close um uh, so it's really close to the track so you, and, it, and it, they love their athletics there so like yeah, it was yeah. a full stadium you're talking like you know probably 20 30,000 seat stadium just packed in wow. right up over the track sort of thing so the crowd is just buzzing and they know their sport they know their athletics out there um, and so it's buzzing and Ingrid Christensen was trying to break the 10,000 meter world record in yeah. that race as well right. um, I think she lapped me mum once or twice in that um, but uh, me mum broke the English record in that race beat the three other Brits so made sure she went um, yeah, and then yeah and then, and then London the next year um, that's how she qualified for the Olympics basically me dad uh, he was a good runner, he was a good county level runner, he ran for, well they both ran for Sutton originally and then Sutton had a split in the mid 80s, uh, my mum was headhunted to Sale Harriers, um, right. my dad went to Warrington, um, we had a good right. men's team and stuff and he had mates there so he went and joined them along with a lot of other men from from Sutton um, and so um, yeah he was a good sort of county level runner at the time he ran yeah. for, for Lancashire when it was Lancashire so Merseyside didn't exist Great Manchester didn't exist so yeah. it, was, it was a harder team to get into as it until you know as it is now um, so a good sort of county level runner but he, he, he loves sport he, he loves running uh, really anorak nerd on, on running uh, similar to myself to be fair I take after him um, whereas my mum was pure competition like she 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 doesn't really understand part run now she she doesn't get why people go out and run <laughs> uh, for fun to be fair yeah um she's she yeah she, she can't run the times that she used to run and so doesn't see the point in it much uh, she still gets out and does a little bit yeah, but um they were doing london they'd done the miles that, that they all, all the lads from warrington were all going london so yeah. this my dad said oh i don't want to just do london it's the trials for the olympics we'll do that and then focus on the ten thousand. so she went um she finished third third yeah. brit fifth overall um, wasn't necessarily selected straight away because there was other people who didn't run but had the qualifying standard and were bigger names um, but as it went on they, they pulled out for various reasons um, and then yeah probably about a month or so to go before the Olympics um, local journalists sort of said you know why, why are you not going to the Olympics um, and she said well I've not been selected not been invited or anything like that he got in touch with British Olympic Association said, oh, well, oh we didn't think she'd want to go um, was what they turned around and said. Yeah, the, the politics of, of, of top end athletics is, is a, a nightmare. And um, so, yeah, four weeks to go, she was flown out to Tokyo to the training camp in Tokyo, which is completely different climate to Seoul. Um, you know, but um, that's where British athletics decided to send their, their, their runners as a training camp. And no good for marathon runners because the only place they had for running was a golf course. So it was all up and down hills. Um, you know, on a nice flat training for a marathon is not ideal. Um, so I think they sent her out. They, they did like a, a two and a half k um, out and back course that they let them on, and they had like a yeah. like army vehicle with them to the uh, Anyway, no one had told me mum that she thought it was an out and back five k course. Um, so um, she got to the end point and was meant to turn round and didn't know yeah. she was meant to turn round. So she carried on through into the open <laughs> road of traffic, and they were shouting her back when she wasn't. She was on a session. She was doing it the way she wanted to do it. <laughs> Um, the top names, British names, didn't go to that camp. They had their own camps because they were big enough to 
yeah, do yeah. their own thing. Um, and then, yeah, she went to Seoul. Um, she finished 32nd, um, so inside the top half. Um, 2.35 something, it was, a, it was a marathon best from London, a little bit slower in Seoul, I think a minute or so slower. Um, again guys, there you go, there's a time. Uh, chase that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I finally became fast, the, the fastest marathon runner in the family uh, the other year, um, but it took a while. Um, and then, yeah, my dad was a good county runner, uh, my Uncle Neil, um, was my mum's brother, younger brother, um, he was an international steeplechaser, um, British champion over the steeplechase barrier and stuff like that. So Quite it's definitely years. in the blood. Yeah, and, uh, and my granddad founded St. Alan's Striders, right, um, he worked in um, the, the pits in, uh, in, in Bold, um, and then yeah, when they, they closed he set up a yeah. little running club, um, uh, Derby Hill Runners at the time it was called, for all the ex-miners, yeah. um, it was more like a drinking club. Um, than a running club, but they did a bit, and then yeah, he, I think he, I think Billings is a bit yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. To be honest. Um, and then he uh, and then yeah, that became yeah. St. Helens Striders. He sort of he did a couple of marathons and then got bored of doing them and, and saw people doing the long jump and the triple jump, and mm. so decided to have a go at that at 60. And Fantastic. he broke the British record for the the long jump, the triple jump, and the high jump. I think they've been broken since, but at 60, 65, 70, 75, and 80, and um, was the last ones he, he sort of broke there, so yeah. Amazing, absolutely amazing. So it's definitely in the DNA. Yeah. <laughs> um, so moving forwards, gear. We're yep. going to get into some, sh into some shoes here okay. now. Um, the carbon plated shoes. Mm. Um, how did you feel when they arrived? Because there's been a lot of controversy about them. Yeah. I, I love them. Yeah. But there's a lot of people who are <laughs> still like, we'll turn the nose up at them. Like, you know, people are breaking old records in these new shoes. What's your thoughts on them? So, so, so my thought is, if if they're as good as everyone says they are, mm -hmm. why are British men still struggling to run under two ten in the marathon? Yeah. Okay, that's the one. Because you go back to the sixties and seventies, and British men would run two hundred eight, two hundred nine, two hundred seven with Steve Jones, yeah. all stuff like that, in basically plimsoll sort of shoes, stuff yeah. like that, barely anything, no nutrition. They were working full-time jobs, everything like that. So fastest yeah. man in Merseyside is Jeff Smith. I know Jeff well, relatively well. I see him, he comes to Croxless Park Run when he's back over from the States. Yeah. Uh, I have a chat with him. Uh, really fantastic guy, amazing runner. Um, you can watch his uh, New York Marathon where he, 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 he leads it out for a long way and Rod Dixon just gets him just at the end. Um, he, was, he was a sub four minute miler and he was a, a sub 210 marathon runner. Yeah. So. If, so the records are being smashed, but records are being smashed by the African athletes. So the African athletes, when you look at the time scale of how long they've been competing for, is relatively small in the grand scheme of distance running, longevity of how long the yeah. events have been around. Yeah. And they have continued to progress. The women's records are coming down quicker. The women's, yeah. British women's marathons are coming down. No one's still close to Paula. Yeah. Um, again, without carbon plated shoes around that time. Um, and the only person to break it was in a carbon plated shoe. So again, there's a question, well, why is no one suddenly smashing that one? Yeah. Um, but so the, the you know the times haven't come down that dramatic. Yeah, there's been top times at the very top end by yeah. a lot of the African runners and stuff like that. But they're still learning and developing in the events. Yeah. Um, they're still you know money's now becoming accessible to them. They can now train full time. Yeah. You know, sort of thing. They're not necessarily having to work or stuff like that. So there's the the science is getting the, you know people are going out there and going okay. You know, Ineos are sponsor. Kipchoge's mm. team and stuff like that, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. yeah, they live in, you know, really humble sort of um, camps camp that they have yeah. and stuff like that. But he's also got like the money of Ineos behind that camp. So, you know, what the science, the, the I mean, the, the, you've seen the strength and conditioning videos that Kipchoge does. African runners didn't used to do strength and conditioning no. sort of stuff, do you know what I mean? Like, like they, they would run and that was it. They've got like huge, they're in the gym doing strength, I mean, it's a humble yeah. gym, but it's strength and conditioning. They weren't doing that. Yeah. So, yeah, the shoes might have some benefit. For me, the benefit of the shoes is that you can run a marathon and you can pretty much within a week get back to training ready for another one, which is a big benefit. Yeah. And it helps you, it, you know, keeps away the injuries and stuff like that. Lets you, lets you, oh, doesn't keep away the injuries. I'll get onto that in a second. Carbon plate shoes have their own problems, but um, it, it, it lets you, it, yeah. it doesn't, you don't feel as beaten up by the end of a run that you would do if you ran in, in a plimsoll sort of shoe, which the guys mm. used to run in. But the times aren't coming down that much. You know, in, yeah. in since, so, so the, the new qualifying standard for the world champs is 2.09 for the marathon, 2.09.40 for the marathon, right. right? There is no British man who has run that in the, in, in the qualifying period. Um, there's only three British men that have run under that standard in the last 10 years. That's Mo Farah, 
who's run 205. That's Callum Hawkins, who's run 208 something. And Dewey Griffiths, who's run 20940. Yep. That's it. That's the, that's the only three men who've run under 210. Right? So if carbon plate shoes had that much performance, why are the Brits not suddenly jumping yeah. under that? Why, why are we not rewriting the history books of British marathon yeah. running? Track spikes. Again, there's a lot of records people, but the so is the track surface is better, the, you know, the conditions are better, the, again, the science, everything, it's all yeah. better than it was. So for me, the shoes, the shoes let you recover quicker. That's the benefit to them. I looked into it myself and like, I've spoke to people like, oh, them shoes, they've got springs in them. I don't actually think it's the plate. Well, it's a combination, yep. but I think the science is more in uh, the foam. Yeah. So the, not, the plate yeah. is, in my mind, is the stability. Yeah. It's not, people think it gives you this huge pop, but it, it's, that, that's more of the foam in yeah. from what I've researched. Yeah, and so it's, so basically the, the, all, all three of the technologies that are in the carbon plate shoes have existed for years, yeah. uh, but they've never been able to make them in the way that they can now make them. So, yeah. a, a really cushioned high stack height shoe. So if you look yeah. at an old school racing shoe, it was nothing. It was light as possible, barely yeah. any foam in it because foam was heavy. Yeah. So now what they've managed to engineer is foam that's really, really lightweight, which means you can yeah. put a load of it on the bottom of a shoe and yep. still be a really lightweight shoe. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you've got a load of shoe, no load of foam on there. So now you're sort of up here, you, you, you know, you're an extra inch taller than you were, yep. but now you're a bit wobbly because you're an extra inch taller than you were and you're not <laughs> well, used to that and you can't feel the ground beneath your feet anymore either. So that's giving you a lot of protection, but yeah. which is, you know, you, you, if you look at like your high mileage just training shoes, yeah. that's what they are. They're big cushion, but they are a little bit unstable or a little bit wobbly feeling. Mm. So what you need to do then? Okay, you need to put a carbon plate in there. That stabilizes just, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That and yet, sense. and and so from the plate perspective, the spring effect. So if we talk about the spring effect, that spring is only going to work if you can load that spring. You have to have. So the people who are going to benefit more from the spring are, are, the, are the bigger runners. The, either, either more powerful, I benefit a lot more than a lot of elite runners in the Alpha Fly, yeah. which is why a lot of the elite runners don't wear the Alpha Fly, because it's so much stack. Yeah. To get any, to, to compress that and then get the plate to compress, you yeah. have to be a little bit heavier. You have to put a little bit more force through that. So if you're a stick thin, typical distance runner, you, you're not going to load yeah. that as well. The Vapor Fly is a little bit firmer in its foam, a little bit less of it, and therefore they can load it a little bit better. Yeah. But and, and, and you see a lot of the mass runners now wearing the Alpha Fly, and that yeah. will benefit them significantly. Yeah, and yeah. which is why Alpha Fly Two has been designed in a way to target the mass runners over the elite runners. Right. With that in mind, because it's been a bit more stable, it's got a little bit more weight on it because it, the, don't, the weight doesn't matter as much if it's given the spring motion and the benefit of not feeling like you've run a marathon after yeah. you've run a marathon. And so, but if you if you are bigger, if you are heavier you're going to be able to load that spring and get more spring motion out of it. Yeah. So it, it, you are going to get that, but you're also not breaking the world record if you're a big... Typically, uh, maybe someone will. Yeah. I don't want to, you know, <laughs> say the... Uh, uh, but, you know, typically you're not going to. That's, yeah. you know, the, um, so, you know, there's that, 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 that's where the, the technology is. Yeah. They've been able to take these technologies that they've had for years, because carbon plates were in shoes back in the 90s. They just didn't work. Yeah, and I think Reebok had them, Filler had them. It just, it just, it, they didn't have the soft foam cushioning to yeah. it. It became too, too stiff. And you can look at some of the, um, the, the zoo, uh, uh, the five k one that Nike did. Uh, the Street Fly is a firmer, less cushioned shoe, and not many people yeah. liked it because well, it's to be honest, it's just I didn't get that shoe because I wasn't really sure what it was. No. It just seemed like a vapor fly but stripped down. Uh, yeah, and it was, all I it, it was got from that. It was lower stack so that and, and close to the ground so that if you come to corner because the issue is with the with the high stack height, when you come to corner, which over a 5k you generally have more mm. laps, it's it's a more tight turns. Whereas a marathon generally you end up with lots of long straights and things or yeah, gentle yeah. curves. So you, it doesn't matter too much on the on the on the on the, on the cornering. But with the street fly, so it was designed for the 5K to race in it. But yeah. because of that, it then became really firm, really stiff. And it, unless you could load that plate, you weren't going to get that spring and you weren't going to get the recovery of, of doing it. So yeah. people preferred the vapor fly for it because they take the issue of the cornering and just wear the vapor fly anyway. I think or as an all rounder, the vapor fly. Non Nike shoes, which are a million <laughs> times better, and you should buy non Nike <laughs> shoes because I can't stock them because they don't like the little guys. But you know, it's another story. Um. <laughs> 
Yeah, but like racing I'm, Nike. Sorry, <laughs> I, I've seen guys on like YouTube and stuff, and they'll like they'll bend um, the shoe in half and they'll like let it go and be like, yeah. it's got springs. Yeah. But at when, that when point, you, you can no that, longer use that shoe. <laughs> no, it's broke. You thought if you ever look at a runner, they don't. Obviously, your foot does bend, but it never yeah. bends like yeah. you see in these examples, and it goes flying across yeah. the room. So that's a unfair um, so, demonstration. And, yeah, and and so that comes on to the negative side of of the carbon plate. So a lot of people now will use. I, I've been to trail races, so as a trail club, please, I hope there's not any of them. Especially, I hope there's not you <laughs> running in an Alpha Fly doing a trail run. And I have seen people, and I know people that have done it. Um, it is a pure race shoe. It is not. It is not stable enough to go on the trail. Got, you will break. You you might be lucky for a while, but you will break an ankle running in that on the trails. It's got no traction either. Has it's it? got no traction, but it's got. got no it, you, you're on a you're on a platform. You, you can't feel the ground beneath your feet. No. You're gonna you're gonna break something. There's 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 yeah. better shoes to wear. Um, yeah. The other bit of a carbon plate is that because it is doing some of that work of the foot, it is you know even you're still getting some spring. You just might not get the huge yeah. benefits to it. Um, but there's still some spring motion to it. Um, it's doing the work of the foot. The foot is a spring. The, the foot does that motion. So yeah. the injury I had in my knee was caused by wearing the carbon plate. It's used too much during marathon training. So I would yeah. use it on the track for my speed work. I would use it on my long run efforts and stuff like that. And, so, and if I was doing three sessions a week, I would wear it for all three. And so I was then getting, I was taking away the, the strength of my foot muscles. They were no longer doing it because when, yeah. when you load, you so if you land on the forefoot, you, you load the forefoot, you push off the ball, of the foot and the big toe, and that's the, that's the spring motion from the big toe. Um, if you're um, if you're hitting the heel, you land on the heel, you roll through to the forefoot, and again you spring motion off. Yeah. Now, if you're landing on the heel in a carbon plate, it work more so for the for if you're a heel strike on a carbon plate because that's how they're designed to, to land. To be fair, the yeah. bulkier heel is you will then load that plate from the heel. And it will do the spring, yeah. but your foot's not doing anything then. So your foot goes well. What's weaker. the point? Yeah, it's I, I don't need to work anymore. There's no point in me. And so uh, it's yeah. it's not doing that job. It becomes weaker. At some point, it might not bother the foot because you're use you you're, you're using a carbon plate. So you're running that all the time. Your foot's got weak, but it doesn't matter to you because you're still using a carbon plate. But if your foot muscle's weak, mm. then the rest of the chain starts to get weaker. And yeah. somewhere along that, so calves. Um, for me, it was my knee. And so you know, you know, overloaded it. Didn't I wasn't moving correctly through the foot movement because mm. I don't train in that all the time. I train in, yeah. in non-carbon plate shoes. So mm. when I was in the non-carbon plate shoes, I was then not loading my foot properly and the leg, yeah. and therefore got injured. Um, yeah. I then started wearing ultra shoes. Basically, I know you're not a fan of the ultras. I know mm. you've had problems with them, yeah. but I started wearing them because because they're zero drop, because they're natural shape, natural shape toes foot and stuff. Tie, toes spread. can spread everything like that. They allow they allow your foot. They make your foot work because they have to. You, your foot has to work in them. Yeah. So they, if I was going to use the carbon plates as much as I was going to use them, I needed something that countered that. Mm. So I brought in ultra in, in my rotation to counter that. I do agree because they always say like every kid, every child running around with no shoes yeah. on has perfect running form. Yeah. It's when we start wearing bad shoes yeah. we, we lose that we lose yeah. that strength in our feet but, and stuff. i mean heel striking just as a, a principle is designed is caused by running shoes so yeah you, you know but, if you run barefoot you would run on the ball of your foot because if you ran on your heel you'd break your heel bone on the on, on the ground i've said so this to people in training um when i've seen heel strike it's like well how do i not heel strike i was like take your shoes off run down the road if you hit your heel once you'll <laughs> yeah, you've you'll got, yeah. correct it yeah. like that so that's yeah. a good training tip, by so, the way. Yeah. But, um, um, do it on the grass, though, because yes, it will be sore otherwise. Um, <laughs> check for check for uh, glass, um, <laughs> especially in St Helens and Wigan. Oh, um, yeah. But um, <laughs> I can say that I'm from here. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so but that, that heel, yeah, heel striking yeah. running shoes because again, it goes back to less so now with the modern running shoes, mm -hmm. but. If you add more foam to a shoe, it was heavier, and so you would protect the heel bone by adding more foam to it. It yeah. would therefore gravity would drag that down, and you would heel strike, yeah, yeah. Um, and that then causes you to break. If you're heel striking, you're naturally breaking. Now, that doesn't mean go and run, try and get yourself four foot running. If it's efficient to heel strike, and, and, and you can you can get that transition smoothly through, stay heel striking. Don't don't try and fix what's not broke. Um, I it's actually true, transitioned to heel striking as yeah. I moved to the marathon oh, because. Okay. Going up on the ball of your foot and the forefoot puts more pressure on the Achilles and the calves. Right. And over the longer distances, 
is a lot yeah. more work. Is, is that what they call so, the marathon shuffle? Yeah, so you yeah, sort correct, of just yeah. you just try and smooth. I mean, I you know I still very much four foot runner. When I'm picking up speed, I'm very much on the four foot. But if I'm you know if I'm going out long and stuff like that, like mm. take that pressure off the cast and stuff. I, I, is it, but you've got to have that smooth turn. If you yeah, if you're yeah. coming downhill and then slapping four foot, yeah, that's when you're going to have problems. I think it, it needs to be a smooth transition it, across. If, if people are running and they're not, you you're pain free then. Yeah. They should be like fine. Yeah. It's when the pain starts to happen that's when they need to see, like you know, specialists like yourself. They're probably in the wrong shoe then, or they yeah. are doing something wrong. Um, yes, yeah. we're still recording for you. <laughs> One second. Do you want to check it. Just One to check. <laughs> <laughs> still recording. Still going. Oh God, we're that's still right. going. That's all right. We've just hit an hour. Oh, that's not a problem. I have been sat here for the last 20 minutes shitting myself, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> that, uh, that happens. Um, right, so where was I? Um, yeah, so on the... We'll, we'll, we'll jump past the carbon stuff in a minute, but... Um, <laughs> sorry, the carbon plated. I actually got injured. Um, it, you know my soul... You know your soleus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like your calf or your lower calf. Yeah. I damaged both of them. And um, I was speaking to my coach about it. He was like, I wonder what it is. Have you up the load or whatever? And then he said, what, what are you training? I was like, I'm training an old pair of vape flies. <laughs> but you know what it's like, you can run so fast in them. Yeah. They are soft. You get like, if you want to pick up the pace, you can. Yeah. Um, that's what I was doing. And I, I took like damaged both my soleuses. Yeah. She was like, oh, you need to get a new shoe. That's when I come to see you. Yeah. Um, I told you off. You told me off. <laughs> you actually said the exact same thing. So I was like, right, I need a new shoe. Um, what I have transitioned to now, um, I do some work in the Boston Tens. Yeah. Um, they are. They There's have still like still carbon rods in there, but it's, well, but the, it's, but the rod sort have, of thing is a little bit different. It follows your your, your, your toes and it, it, it gives yeah. a little bit more flexibility. Now this one, uh, I'm still using that one, yeah. but I've also got the Speed Two as well now. Okay. Yep. Um, Nylon plated, so again a little bit more flexible. Offers a little bit of it. Yeah. So more versatile. It's 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 plated, but it's. It's my daily trainer. Yeah. So obviously the kind of stuff I uh, train, probably like yourself, I'll be doing some like slow stuff and then I'll do some like fast efforts. Yeah. So that kind of Sockany Speed 2 uh, with that nylon plate does help you. Yeah. It's, it's light enough. It's got that vapory feel. Yeah. Um, but it's, yeah. it's not, you're not fully relying yeah. on a plate. Yeah. So. The, the nylon plate offers a lot more versatility to it. So it, it does, it's, yeah. it's a lot more flexible. So your foot's still doing some of that work. It's not, yeah. it, it's not doing, like if you had the, the Pro, the Saucony Endorphin Pro, that's a carbon plate in there yeah. and that is very stiff and that does a lot of the work. So yeah, the speed, a lot more flexible. You can train in it. It's a lot yeah. more versatile for that. It's a training shoe. It's the companion to the, to the Pro. Yeah. Um, the Endorphin Shift is the other one. That's Shit. in that lineup, so that's the so that's a non-plated shoe at all. There's no so plate is that in that. The one? That's the bulky, chunky, chunky sole on that one, and it's a different foam in there. It's a bit firmer, a bit heavier. Um, is that like? Would you say sort of, that's a long run shoe, or like is that a daily for the trainer? Mix, yeah, a daily trainer sort of thing. It's, it's not as fast feeling as the as the speed, but the speed you, you can still do a bit of work. For me, it. is it is an, it's an everyday shoe, mm. but I, it, I I think it leans a lot towards tempo shoe in yeah. my opinion. Yeah, it does. Like you can. You put that shoe, like, we're not trying to sell it, by the way. We're just, like, we're just... Well, version 3 is in the shop right now. Is it? Yeah. Well, you didn't tell me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to trying them as well, because it's I a little, It's a little them. more stable. So they've, w they've winged the plate, so it yeah. wraps a little bit round, so it gives you a little bit more structure and stability in there, because right. one, version 1 and 2, were, they were so soft, the foam, and because the plate's not as stiff, it does make it a well, little wobbly. I, I will say I've rolled... You know what it's like when you yeah. roll your ankle a bit, like... Uh, not like a fatal injury, just like a, oh, it's going to ache for a couple of days. I have done that a few times in the speed too, so yeah. I can see why they would have. They've, yeah, they've tried um, to stabilise it. They've stabilised that up. Um, what are your thoughts on pure stability shoes and the technology and yeah. how that's developed over time? Because yeah. I remember the first stability shoe I run in, the Adidas um, Solar ST. ST, yeah. Um, Loved that shoe, yeah. but it it was it felt like it was it was just fully cushioned on the one side. Yeah, that's all it was at yeah. the time. So how has technology come forward? So it, it it's evolved a lot now, and it was funny. I, I was chatting to a customer uh, today about them. We were looking at the Brooks, the Brooks line. Um, so they have the glycerin, the Ghost, and um, the Adrenaline. Launch. Uh, underneath, underneath they're the neutral, and oh. then they have the glycerin GTS, the Adrenaline GTS, and the yeah. Launch GTS, and they're the support. Now for me, I think. What they should do, 
but they won't do it is and it, it would benefit me as a retailer it wouldn't benefit them as a, a brand and, and they is just cut the neutral shoes because of the way the supports are now done yeah, yeah. So the support now, majority of the brands, pretty much Hoka did it from day one, Ultra have done it from day one, uh, Brooks moved into it a couple of years ago, Adi uh, Asics have gone into it, Adidas have now done it, uh, Sikoni have pretty much gone that way, is they've also got this guide rail system of support, mm. so it used to be a, a medial post, which is a big solid block underneath yeah, the arch yeah. of the foot, prop the arch up, solve the problem, it didn't, it, it solved didn't, the problem no. if you had a flat arch or a collapsing arch and it, propped yeah. it, it just propped it up. If your issue is a weak ankle, a weak, you know, weak knee stability, weak hips, which 95% of runners probably don't quote yeah. me on that. I'm not a physio or a trained uh, health specialist or anything like that. But um, there's a lot of problems for runners in the hips. Yeah. We don't do anything with our hips. We, we might do exercises for our ankles and yeah. maybe our knees, our calves will do that. We probably forget about the hips majority of the Monster time. Monster walks. They're mm. one of the best yeah. things to the hips. Um, so, um, but basically, it, it, yeah, so it used to just prop up, so it solved the problem that was the idea of it mm. um, and it didn't it didn't work on if the issue was higher up the chain than just the arch of the foot and um, the way all the brands have now pretty much moved is they've moved to a guide rail system and the easiest way to describe that is if you think of the rails in a bowling alley as, as a mm. kid and you've got the rails up mm. if you're over pronating you know there's an imbalance in there and your you, you, your ankles dropping in or, or even to the outside to the ex, to, too far to the outside to an extent and um, you there's a, there's a rail on the shoe yeah. and so you, if hit, you come in like that or you come so, in yeah like that. yeah so you, so you so ideally what you want is your heel to be in line with your knee in line with your hip so a nice straight line through forces yeah. you're applying the force down to the ground equal opposite forces are acting up and they're dispersed evenly across each chain of the joints in the chain. Yeah, yeah. If, you're, if you're rolling in too much or slightly to supinate into the outside, mm. most people will land on the outside of the foot, pronate to neutral, and then it becomes over pronation. It's, it's, it's not a real technical term, it's just what's used by the industry. It's just continued pronation basically. Um, over pronation is, yeah. isn't a real scientific term, it's just what we all use because it makes the most sense. Um, but it's just continued pronation, but it, it's to a point where you, you then throw in the body out of line. Um, and so basically, the, the, if, if, if you're doing that in a guide rail shoe, you hit this rail, and this rail then tries to guide you back into a more neutral position. Yeah. Depending on what causes, what's causing your overpronation, yeah. um, you will you will overpronate at a various point within the gait cycle. Mm. Um, and so that rail then hits that point and it helps yeah. you guide you back it tries you to guide in. you back in yeah. so it's not forcing you to do it but you you, you it's the proprio reception you, you're going to feel your foot hit this more firm and more solid material and try and then move and yeah. you'll try and you'll try and get away from that because you don't want to hit that material yeah. if you're neutral well you can run in that and just keep striking you feel it. you're not yeah, going to hit yeah. you're not going to hit that guide rail yeah. but over time on a long run you're going to fatigue, and if you fatigue, yeah. your tendons and your ankle and stuff like that, form the form's going to yeah, change, yeah. and so you're going to hit that guide rail. Mm. So what the brands could all do is cut out a load of their shoes and just sell the guide rail in shoes. They're not going to do that because they make a hell of a lot more money by going, here's three shoes here with the guide rail, here's yeah, three shoes without, yeah. here's neutral, here's stability, and they're going to sell more. Yeah, From a retail perspective, awesome. I could cut down on the amount of shoes I have to order if I just had three shoes from each brand that I could go, they're the three, that's yeah, the ma yeah. max cushion shoe, that's the middle sort of road because you that's the lighter faster feeling sort of shoe yeah. pick which one you want they're not going to do that um you know they rebrand brooks so brooks is an example they had the glycerin and the transcend they rebranded the transcend as the glycerin gts mm. and they called it the um uh, a super uh, like branding thing sort of thing uh, to rebrand it they had the ghost and the adrenaline now they're mm. they kept the name ghost and adrenaline because they're the two number one specialist running shoes sales mm. figure wise from a neutral and a support perspective well, so think, they didn't rebrand the names on them yeah then they had the launch which is neutral and they had the ravenna which was the support and they right. rebranded the ravenna the launch gts because they kept this this branding it's, story it's, it's a bit confusing but, isn't it but i remember um i was running in um the good shoes and brooks do really well for us yeah, well, DR, <laughs> to be just, honest. just before uh, Brooks get upset with me from I was in um, <laughs> you saw me in Adrenaline GTS yeah. I loved it yeah. loved it um, I was in that for a good 18 months but I always felt I couldn't run super fast in that shoe no um, it was very it's a, good it's a daily, daily trainer it's a daily trainer yeah but then obviously that's when the vapor flies come out and I was like Jesus like, I just wanted to run in that every, yeah. every day <laughs> um, but injuries in, injuries <laughs> it's happened to us both don't do it um what is your thoughts on the competitors of like the Vaporfly, like um, Metaspeed Sky, Metaspeed Edge? Yeah. 
Um, so I, I would Zen Eight. Yeah, that's is that the flagship Adidas? No, so the, so the Zen Eight is the is is the five K. Is the um, like the, the street, street fly. fly. Street oh, okay. I, I've never tried the street fly, but I love the Zen 8 as a track shoe. It's my go-to track training oh, okay. shoe. Yeah, yeah. Basically, because it's got full, con well, it's got continental rubber on the sole. And if you want tacky grip on a road shoe, there is nothing better than, than continental rubber. Yeah. It is fantastic. I, I, I've got a pair I, on I, now. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I've never tried it. Adidas. I wasn't yeah. an Adidas fan. My dad always raised me as Adidas were a football shoe, so don't go near him. Uh, my girlfriend loves Adidas, so I was like, well, I'll go on, I'll give him a try. Tried a couple of, she had like the, the Adidas Adios Pro um, 1, mm -hmm. uh, she got me the Pro 2, Didn't wasn't a fan of it, I like the, the Alpha Fly and stuff and I'm still Alpha Fly fan. Uh, I try and get away from Nike, as I say, they took themselves out of independent stores a good 15 years ago. Um, they, basically, you had to have a 35 grand minimum order, uh, opening a, minimum order, opening order to open an account with them. So basically, little, little stores like us just couldn't do it. Um, and then 2020, Christmas 2020, they gave notice to all the stores that did have accounts with them from historic sort of accounts. Gave them notice to say, look, your account's closed in 12 months time, sell through That's what you've got. Like um, they see themselves as big enough to just, people just go to them, which they yeah. do. I don't think they offer the best training shoes anymore. I think the training shoes are more lifestyle. Race shoes, yeah. I'll be honest, they're, they're alpha fly, there's nothing like it. There's a couple of shoes coming that could be close, not fully yeah. test them, but there's nothing like it yet for me. Vaporfly, going back to the question, um, I think every brand has now caught up. You think so? This, 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 the stuff that's come out this summer, I think equals the Vaporfly now. I yeah. think every brand's got it. I think, to be fair, I think, especially since the Vaporfly 2 hasn't gone down as well as Vaporfly 1. Um, yeah. I, 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 I grabbed a Vaporfly 1 when Vaporfly 2 came out just because people were saying it wasn't as good. Um, I still got that. I prefer the Alpha Flight, but yeah. your Endorphin Pro 3, fantastic. Um, your, your Metaspeed Sky um, Edge. and Edge are, yeah. are both great. Um, the Plus, plus, I think they're called now, Sky which is version plus, 2 something. rather than, yeah, it's, yeah, but it's yeah. Plus, I think it's called. Um, your, uh, your New Balance is really soft, really springy. I've, I've, I've run in, in the, uh, the RC um, and the new version of that. It's just come out and that's, it's the SC now it's called, um, Elite and that's that's cracking shoe. Um, Hoka, they have some as well, don't they? Hoka have some, the new one, they've finally done a new foam, so it's finally caught up because they were, they were just doing EVA foams, which was what you get in your general everyday trainer sort of shoes. Mm. And it was like, come on guys, let's let's update it, yeah, let's yeah, get yeah. something new. Because um, the the rest of the foams are all used like PBEX sort of foams, which is a different compound, it's softer, springier sort of stuff. Um, my coach was sponsored by Hoka, Last year he left them. Um, he's now coached by Ryan Hall, and he's just been sponsored by Puma. Uh, Puma's got some really Ooh. nice stuff. Yes, I forgot. Um, I, can't, they, I can't believe I they, forgot to write them down. Yeah, uh, they'll be. They should have been coming into the shop this summer. I don't know where they are. Um, I'm going to well, chase uh, our, uh, our our Puma rep actually on them. Yeah. Um, but they, we will definitely be getting them next season because I've seen, I've made sure the orders there. I don't know where this summer's lot went. Um, but yeah, they, they've got some really nice stuff. He's, he's running some great times in them. So th th there's some good stuff there. Fast R is the like Alpha Fly sort of one. And uh, the, again, um, tried it, but. the kind of daily training one was is the Nitro. Yeah, the Nitro, nitro and then something. the Magnify is the, uh, yeah, the Nitro mm. Deviate uh, it. 2. Um, it's yeah. just come out. Um, and the Magnify is a like mileage sort of shoe. Um, the, the Nitro, the heel cup on it is, uh, it, it could be a little bit more secure fitting. Um, was my feedback from version one of it. Um, I meant to be getting a Magnify to try. I've not tried it yet, but it, it, I was chatting to Scott Overall, who's an ambassador for them. He's an yeah. Olympian as well. Um, he was commentating on Antrim the other week yeah, yeah. Uh, when I was there. Um, he's he's an ambassador for them. He said he prefers the, the Magnify um, as his right. sort of daily trainer sort of shoe. Right. Um, so a bit of feedback from him. Um, as well, uh, there is a shoe I've had my eye on for a long time. Now, I know a lot of trail runners um, they look at the road shoes and the carbon plates, yeah. but carbon plates have now arrived for the trail running community. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the Socony, is it Edge? Yeah. Uh, has that arrived in store yet? Uh, it's not, we've not taken it. Right. We do very, we, we, you got, Billings runners need to come yeah. more and, and buy shoes because we stock very little trail shoes because we don't get much people asking for them. So yeah. we keep expanding it every year. Um, We've got some great shoes in there at the moment. We've just got the yeah. Mafati, the new Mafati in there, which is fantastic from Hoka. Um, we've got some of the, the Sacconi. Um, 
Exodus Ultras, so great yep. for your Ultra sort of stuff. Uh, but yeah, we, we don't get a huge calling for it, so we, we, okay. we're growing it every year, but if you guys come more, maybe, maybe Definitely. we'll get more, more well, ribbons. That's... Um, and I can get order stuff in from the brands that we have access to, so yeah. if you want a specific shoe that we don't stock, we can get hold of it. Right. Uh, but yeah, the, 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 the carbon plate, the, you had the um, endorphin, um, the endorphin trail as well. It wasn't called that, it was called something else. It came out for a season, and then basically the upper didn't work. It had a manufacturing issue, so it got recalled, and uh, then they fixed it, and it's, it's coming back out it's now. It's the Edge one now. No, the Edge is a different one. I edge thought it was shoe. called the Endorphin Edge. It, it, it's the pink one, the luminous pink one. It that, might... that runs across like the whole Endorphin line. That oh, luminous does it? Yeah, because the, oh, the Pro right. 3's in it as well. Like, um, I'll have to double check that one, but yeah. I, I'm sure. There's a, there's a couple, they, they've got a couple carbon yeah. plate trail shoes, but Hoka's got a carbon plate trail shoe out. Um, and they, they started in Ultra, the, the, the origins of Ultra Trail sort of running. So, yeah, um, yeah there's, there's, there's some interesting uh, carbon plate on the trail, verdicts out a little bit because obviously you want your foot to be able to move easily when you hit a rock or a tree root. Yeah. So, you put a carbon plate in there that stiffens it. Is, is that going to work yeah. or not? I, I, think, I think it depends on the type of trail. Yeah. And I think the American market, which a lot of the shoes are designed for, yeah. is you know, you're talking more these long ultra gravel dirt paths yeah, sort of thing. Yeah. If we're talking, you know, um, UK sort of trails with a lot of mud, like we're still proper there. trail, proper tra yeah, proper trails. We, you know, we're cross real cross country over yeah, here, yeah. they run around on gravel. You know, <laughs> well, no, they're, they're cross countries, so they're like yeah. golf courses with palm trees on, um, <laughs> pancake flat, and they're not allowed to put spikes in them because they don't yeah. want to rest the golf course up. You know, we, we've we got 18 mil spikes in ours, you know what I mean? So. <laughs> There's a difference, and it, I think, yeah, you, you've got to look at, at the train you're sort of going on and stuff like yeah. that, I think, and, and, and maybe adjust for that. Excellent. Well, I'll, um, I'll get you on to my last question now, Matt. Mm -hmm. So, um, question of the day for Matt. Um, your favourite racing shoe of all time. If you was going to say to someone, that's go race your 5K on Marathon app, what would it be? Well, it be? All time. See, all time it <laughs> becomes hard, because... I currently racing the Alpha Fly. Yeah. I've just been testing out a shoe uh, from Xtep. Yeah. Um, it's just been released. It's a Chinese brand. It's, it's, it's quite similar to the Alpha Fly. Um, I, I'm, I'm edging my bets between an, an Alpha Fly or them for, for, for London. But of all time, if we if we go back pre-carbon racing, mm -hmm. um, there was there were some cracking shoes. Yeah. And, and to be fair, my, my probably favourite, just because it's a favourite memory of a race, is, is the Nike Luna Racer. Right. Uh, so, or, or, the, or the Brooks Hyperion Racer, the old school like Hyperion, not the elite carbon plate stuff that they got now, like the yeah. old school racer, it was like paper thin. Um, but the Luna Racer I, I got, it was the National Road Relays at uh, Sutton Caulfield. Um, I think it was my first year, second year for Sutton. And went down there and like they'd just come out the, the foam in them was designed for NASA. So Nike right. designed it for NASA. It was used in the rockets, in the space, in the, in the space rockets, because it was um, <laughs> as, a, as, an as an insulator. But right. they, they couldn't release it in the shoe for like five years or something. You know, it was a patented you know, sort of use, but oh, they designed right, it for okay, them. So yeah. it's it kept for, you know, they didn't want Russia getting it or whatever, China yeah, getting it, yeah, stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. So it was in the shoes, uh, it was super lightweight, summer spring. I mean, it's been far outdone now by latest foams and stuff, but back then it was, it was revolutionary. Yeah. And, um, they, they, they just come out and they, they, the store that was there at the, the race had them and I went to my dad I said oh you know I was, I was 16, 17 at the time I said, dad I've got to try them on yeah, yeah. tried them on and like I was like oh I've got to have these dad like I've got to race in these today you know yeah. don't you wouldn't do that normally um, so we, my dad bought them like for me and we I, I, I had an awful start to this race got like boxed in it was like mallet behind everyone just like wet, like once it opened up the path like race through him and um, just as it finishes going uphill to like the handover point of the relay to the next the next leg and um, i just sprinted like mad and passed um charlie holson who runs for new balance team now manchester he's yeah. you know he's, he's a fantastic runner he had some, some amazing success. and i just out sprinted him and finished came home first on the, the national road relays so great memory so i, I love those shoes for that and then yeah the hyperion uh, the hyperion sorry um uh, original race shoe from brooks old school sort of race uh, you know super lightweight paper thin up yeah. um you know barely any cushioning did my first uh, half marathon in there um they were fantastic like i absolutely yeah. loved them but yeah in the carbon plate world those sort of shoes just just yeah, they don't they don't come near to that just for that protection basis. You know, I you know I did like I say did Manchester backed it up with Liverpool two weeks later. Um, you know, the first time I raced in the Alpha Fly, I came. It was a half marathon. It was Antrim. The first time I did that, right, I okay. came back and ran 10k the following weekend. Never yeah. would I have done that 
racing in. You didn't in. have that I, shoe. Yeah, it, well, in a, not in that sort of foam and, and cushion shoe. Yeah. You know, when I ran um, my, my first half marathon in the, in the Hyperion, it was yeah, a great yeah. race. And I ran a great time for the debut and I ran just over 70 minutes. But I don't think I walked straight for a week after it. You know, and that's the difference it makes, yeah. you know, sort of thing. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So, so they're not springs, are they, really? They, they, they just help you recover for the next Yeah, they help you recover. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. It's fantastic. Well, thank you very much for coming on today, Matt. No, uh, thanks for having me. I hope I didn't uh, bore too much. Of the, oh, uh, no, the you've crammed stuff, a lot so. in there. Um, yeah. <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no, I think that's it. I think, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, I think I've covered uh, everything and probably upset people and things like that, so we'll <laughs> oh, see how it goes. Not at all. Well, anyway, <laughs> um, thank you very much for coming on. Oh, um, thank you all for watching. Awesome. Uh, please uh, subscribe. Yeah, like, share, subscribe. You know the drill. <laughs> and uh, we'll be back next week with another episode. So, yeah, um, thank you. Matthew Creel. Cheers.